everyone, this is Yara Star. Welcome to another video interview with a guest expert. Uh, today I have Andrew Warner with me from Mixergy.com, but that's uh, his current project. He's had quite a few projects before this. So, Andrew, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Now, uh, we're doing the, the video call. Uh, Andrew actually came to my attention through Gideon Shalwick, my business partner, who uh, Andrew interviewed recently, and I was very impressed with uh, uh, your use of video, Andrew, for doing videos, uh, for doing interviews. Sorry, I've been a podcaster for a long time, but uh, I haven't been doing, I guess, video interviews. Uh, and you know, so we're all we're all we're all going in this direction. So it's good to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I'm interested, as always, in entrepreneurship. Of course, that's a topic of my blog. And uh, I've grabbed you on this interview because you obviously have a history of various projects, um, some bigger, some smaller. And I just want to get a bit of a background. And, and when I say bigger, you've had uh, the seven-figure, the million-dollar project. So it's uh, always more interesting, I think, to people when you've got that in your resume. So we definitely want to find out about that. But before we do, maybe you can take Actually, let me just say that it, it, was, uh, it was eight figures technically. We did over $30 million a year in revenue at our height. Even more interesting. So, <laughs> so that's a bit of a teaser for everyone. You have to stay tuned to that story. Um, but we'll, we'll start right back at the beginning. Uh, you know, where are you from? Where did you go to school? And how did you get into running businesses? Sure. Um, I grew up in New York, and if you've ever been to New York, or any of your listeners have been to New York, you you've got a sense of of what I must have experienced every day. Everybody was constantly running around. Everyone was constantly building not just businesses but empires all around me. Now here I was, this dorky little kid who was a big reader, as you can see if uh, you're watching the video from all the books behind me. All I would do is read, and this world existed around me, and I said, those guys are making it. Those guys are living the life. I want to be like them. So I started shifting my reading towards reading business books. I started trying to go out there and figure out how I could be a part of that business world that was around me. And as I would was curious about it and wanted to learn more and be a part of it, it started to take hold of me. And I became this, I think, this this entrepreneur by because of my environment. Um, I was always starting different businesses. I'm, I know that lots of entrepreneurs who I've talked to have had this in their background where they sold candy in school, and I did that too. And like a lot of other entrepreneurs, my teachers told me to stop it. Teachers always will shut down the most, the most interesting part of who you are. If you're a comedian, they'll tell you to stop telling jokes. If you're an entrepreneur, they'll tell you to stop selling candy, and that's what they did for me. But it, it, it allowed my ambition, my, my creative entrepreneurial energy to just keep festering inside until it found an outlet after I graduated from school. Okay, so... You were uh, a little bit crushed in terms of your entrepreneurship when you were younger. But how did, uh, I guess, coming from that background, did it balloon into projects uh, after school, be the, the next place, I'm assuming? So I constantly read different biographies, read different magazines about successful people. Forbes magazine was an especial favorite of mine. There's a magazine that most people don't even remember that Forbes magazine came out with called Audacity. It would have these long stories of of entrepreneurs and I would read it and I said when I graduated from school I said I want to own a magazine like Audacity and so I started kind of printing it up myself and uh, plan to sell it on my own and slowly build this business that would become this empire for myself meanwhile my kid brother was online all the time and he was seeing what was going on on the internet he was seeing that people were building these online email newsletters that people were building these big websites and as much as I wanted to slowly build my company, I couldn't help but see what he was seeing. And eventually I said, you know what, Michael, Let's, let me put aside what I've been working on, the old paper magazine, and see if you and I, as brothers, can start a business together. And that's where the original business idea for us came from. And what, what year was that, Andrew? Um, my guess at this point is that it was maybe 97, maybe 96. I, I think 1997. Okay, and this is an older brother or a younger brother? Younger brother. Younger brother, okay. So, you're... so I was fresh out of college, and he's about five years uh, younger than me. Oh, wow. So he's well and truly in school still then, right? Or just Actually, a... he, was, uh, he was a high school dropout, and then he went on to take college after uh, taking a, a high school equivalency test, and even college didn't hold his attention. He dropped out of that, and just as he was getting going with a job, a decent job, uh, that, where he was programming, where you didn't need college uh, credit in order to get this great job and the salary, I came and proposed this uh, this business. <laughs> Take it. 
terrible brother, terrible. So, <laughs> so you're obviously both uh, entrepreneurial in spirit, and it's interesting that you had, I guess, an, an offline print sort of motivation. And at 97, but I think to 97, you know, it's it's not brand brand new days in the internet, but it's certainly early enough that you know um, there there was no Google there. Uh, I don't think there was, was there eBay then. I think eBay was just getting going, perhaps. I don't remember. Yeah, so I got on in ninety around about ninety eight. That's when I started, and definitely wasn't on Google. It was all Lycos and Hotbot and, and that sort of search engines, and it was extremely different from today. So uh, the fact that you even started a business in that environment must have been different to what uh, it would be now. So what was the project you you began with at that point? So the first thing that we did was well. We looked around and we said, "What's where's the action right now? And at the time, we would we got these email newsletters. It was a word a day by email, and they would teach you different, different vocabulary words or a quote a day. We said, wow, that's an interesting little model. But the people who were running those lists never had any ads in them. So we said, what if we took on that model and we found a way to, to bring in some revenue from it? Okay. And so that was the original model. Now, back then, people wanted email. They were signing up to AOL. They, they would wait for that you've got mail sound, and nothing would happen. I remember myself, I would die for my brother to send me email. I would just give my email address to everyone, hoping that they would send it to us, send, send me some email. Those were the days. Um, and I said, that is going to last forever. People are always going to want email. I was wrong, but at the time, they did. So we said, okay, we don't know how to sell advertising, but we know that there's something here. And what we originally did was we sold our own stuff. Um, by the way, my my fiance brought a kitten home the other day, which is what just jumped up on my desk. <laughs> oh, we should uh, say this come hello. on, buddy. Um, I don't know if he'll come. We took him to the vet. He's he's a hundred percent okay. So he must belong to one of our neighbors. Now she's got signs everywhere trying to find the neighbor who lost his cat. So, uh, so. So the first thing that we did was we 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 sold our own stuff. I wrote an, an ebook on how the stock market worked because in the late 90s the stock market was really heating up. There were stories in the news about how the average person was making money in the market, but no but the average person didn't know how to even get started in the market. So I went to to undergrad business classes. I studied business for forever. And I had all these books. I wrote a really simplified version, uh, really simplified how-to guide to the market. Nothing that, that could replace a, uh, a college education, nothing that pretended to teach everything, but enough to give you the basics. What is a stock? What's the stock market like? How do you make money if stocks go down? And by that, I don't mean giving you trading strategies. I just introduce people to, to short selling. And I wrote this little book. I called it an ebook. I think, a second ago. But it was an actual paper book and, uh, uh, or guide. It was kind of small. And uh, we sold it by email. Michael wrote a system that allowed us to let people sign up for our mailings, let people uh, get our mailings by email, and that was our first product. From there, we started adding a bunch of other products, trying to build more revenue. So I'm curious with this. Uh, we're talking maybe pre-PayPal days, as well as you know, email autoresponders weren't the most common tool available to the average man. So you know, what were your your structures? Uh, for delivering, for taking payment and capturing email addresses. And I'm going to close the door while you do that. Sure. So, actually, Michael, I don't think, was an entrepreneur or a businessman his whole life, but he was an incredible developer his okay. whole life. He could just sit and code up anything. And uh, so he found a way to code up sending emails. Very basic, very basic system, but it worked. Um, and maintaining it was more work, I think, maybe even than building the original version. For payment, believe it or not, for a long time we were just collecting checks. I would love to find – we were still living at home at the time. And so there was one day when we got a stack of checks that we took pictures. My mom took pictures of us, uh, kind of a proud mother seeing all that her, her sons had done. And I got to find that picture somewhere. Kind of when you're working and building a business, you forget about all the old – trophies or all the old pictures because you want to focus on building the business and I kind of regret that I didn't create a box and save all those things somewhere. I, I didn't even take a picture of my, my office because, well, who cared? Yeah. But I'm sure at some point I'd like to show it to my kids, my grandkids when I have either one. Um, so checks for a long time and actually, yeah, checks was the, was the preferred method I think online for a very, very long time. It wasn't – the people weren't comfortable sending their credit cards on 
online. Okay. Now this is not the big business yet though, so I'm assuming something happened to this project that didn't make it continue? Or? So here's what happened. The business grew nicely. We went from, from these books to Michael wrote some software. At the time there was this, uh, there were these news stories about that one day you'll be able to make phone calls on the internet, which just all the techies, geeks like us, blew our minds. One day you can make phone calls. We were dying to try it today, not one day, but today. So Michael wrote this program that would allow you to make phone calls with your voice over the internet. Just incredible. Now you couldn't talk at the same time, tons of limitations. It was more like a CB. I would, t I would press a button and talk to you. Then I'd say pretty much over. Actually, the system would say he's over. And then you would press a button and talk to me, but we'd hear each other's voices online, which at the time just blew people away. He created this program, and if anyone's a techie out there and wants me to get into details, let me know either online or afterwards. But we'll, I could tell you how he did it. Very, very simple. And it sold. And so we did all these little all these little projects. Oh, um, we sold how, how to meet women videotape. Which, which did pretty well back in the early days when it was mostly men. We didn't create that one. That was, I think, the only product that we didn't make ourselves. So we were doing all this stuff. We got to a place where we were making 30000 U.S. a month. The problem was we were killing ourselves, not with the technology, but killing ourselves trying to come up with a new product every freaking day. So how do you come up with a hot new product when... And, and that's the thing. People weren't looking. People were excited about phone over the internet for a few months. They were excited about um, the stock market as long as the stock market was new and novel. Every every few months, we had to every month actually we'd have to come up with new products. And you, if you if you fail, you fail big because it, we have to create these products ourselves. So we said advertising starting to kick up. Let's build a business where people are expecting something different where people are expecting content with a small ad and what I did was we we gave the business the old business to my dad who would just run it and maintain it and he'd have all these guidebooks and my mom would send out these how to meet women videotapes from from their house <laughs> and Michael and I started a new version of the business which we called Bradford and Reed which was a structured business which um which where we had equal partnership of the business where we we worked it all out uh, with a lot more forethought than we did the first business, where you could sign up very easily online to get a quote a day, a word a day, a trivia a day, a joke a day, all those things. And in addition to that, you'd have advertising. This was the business that eventually, not it's the way that I described it, but as we built it up, eventually became that business that I'm so proud of the success of. 30 plus million, as I said, at our height. Okay, well, let's, let's really dive into that. Uh, in terms of development, was that all done in-house by you guys? It was all done in house, and here's the first lesson that I learned there, and the first lesson that I even learned it, it, when we were just futzing around my parents' house. We said, start with garbage. Start with the first version of your business idea that's just so dead simple, maybe even ugly, that you know you're going to chuck it in the future when you build your real thing. But at least it allows you to start off. Um, and so what we did was, there was what was that program that you that Microsoft created that lets you create web pages? Front page. Front page came with themes. We took one of the basic themes from front page. We just put our own content in it. We didn't do any design work on it. And we said, this is our home page. And we called it mailbits.com. Michael created it or, or had a system where we could collect email address from people who signed up and where we could send emails out. The thing that we did that was a little different for most people was we would buy ads in other newsletters because obviously if somebody signed up to a newsletter, they're more likely to sign up to another newsletter because they understand how it works. And we also created a simple email address that they could use to sign up to our newsletter. So if you want to sign up to Trivia a day, you just, you just send an email to trivia at mailbits.com and you'd be signed up. So we could go and buy ads in all these newsletters and we say, if you want to know a trivia question, just email trivia at mailbits.com. Uh, so mailbits.com was our website, our, our main website. Bradford & Reed was the parent company name. Um, and so we were just signing people up by email. We had this clever ad that worked for us at the time. We'd say, um, why is it called a hamburger if it's not made out of ham? Why is it called a hot dog if it's not made out of dog? For the answers to these questions and others, sign up to the trivia mailing list. And people would just want to know the answer to those questions so badly that they would sign up to the mailing. And of course, they could always unsubscribe. But you know, from your data, I'm sure that when you get somebody to join a mailing list, they're not unsubscribing right away. They're going to spend some time figuring it out, whether figuring out whether it's the right mailing for them or not. Okay, so I'm. 
I can see how this is all coming together. You, you're, you're starting to build lists, and you're using your own technology, so it's, it's very, uh, you know, sort of like garage shop style business. How did, and you've got a lot of scale here, but it sounds like to me it's still fairly you and your brother managing everything. So did you spend your entire day writing trivia information and, and researching for, you know, to, to basically fulfill the content requirements of what your people wanted? Yes, and you're right to pick on that mailing. Word a day, very easy. Anyone has an encycl anyone who has a dictionary can copy a word a day. Uh, quote a day, very easy. We all have a collection of quotes that we love, and if we don't, we get a couple of quotes. Trivia, you can't just copy out of another person's book because then it's plagiarism. Mm. So I have to spend all day writing that here. In fact, this is years later. This is just a quick section of the trivia books that to this day, if you're watching us on video and not, not audio, this is just a small section of the trivia books that I still have in my life today. Here's another one. This giant mama jama right here. So I would just read these books and every day I'd find a different trivia, the different uh, question that I, that I thought would be interesting to my readers. I'd, I'd summarize the question in one sentence. I'd have an ad underneath it. And then the answer underneath that. So if you if you saw the question in your inbox and you were so curious that you had to know the answer, you'd at least scan my ad and hopefully go and click over to the website, and then you'd right. get the answer. And, and where were you so, sourcing? So yes, that uh, took me forever. Sorry, uh, where were you sourcing advertising sponsors from? Copying other, I get other people's mailings. I had every single email uh, newsletter that was out there. I would join their mailing list. And then I would see who's advertising in there, and I'd say, all right, if you're happy with your ad in that newsletter, I'm not saying cancel your ad there. I'm saying I'll give you the same results, or I'll give you better results because I've got a newsletter myself. Okay, that's, yeah, that's a great principle. We, I, we do something similar in, in the blogging world nowadays, looking for blog sponsors, so that's a great strategy. So to go from that start to a, an eight-figure business obviously is significant. But looking at that business model, it, it could scale quite far without you necessarily having to increase your um, you know, resource usage too much beyond the technical resources just to deliver more emails. So how did you scale this business? There were, we had no revenue, we had no money ourselves, um, but you didn't need that much to, to, to manage this kind of list. You could pretty much have a bunch of regular desktop computers receive email and send email out. At the time, we could have used uh, the the we could just use regular pop uh, uh, what is it called pop SMTP connections yes, of our ISP. This is before spam became a huge issue, and so we were able to just send our emails out or uh, normally. Okay, so as the business scaled, and as we got into as as the business scaled to the millions of customers, millions of, of subscribers, then we did need new systems in place. Right, and what year are we at now? Okay, Bradford and Reed started in 98. We might still be in 98, 99. Okay. And here's the problem that happened in 98, 99. Spam came out. People were no longer the way that they were when we started our first business, anxious to get email. Nobody woke up in the morning and said, oh, I hope I get email because I got to see what the system's like. They said, I hope I get no, no more email. There's too much spam. So we had newsletters. People would sign up for them, but they weren't anxious to sign up. It was harder and more expensive to get them to sign up. So we had to say to ourselves, we need new ways to get them to sign up. So we tried a bunch of different ways. We would offer money to charity. If you signed up, Yaro, for one of our mailing lists, I would give 10 cents away to charity. And, and that was tough because I'd have to go and partner with the charity. I, for some reason, I thought I had to do everything by the book. So I went, or at least that part I decided I had to do by the book. And I went and I asked permission from the charity to give them money. And they said, well, why do you want to give us money? Why do you want to use our name? And if you're going to use our name, show us where. And it's going to be online. Who knows what's online? I hear child predators are online. So that took a long time. But that was an experiment that didn't work. Um, eventually, users don't care about giving 10 cents to charity by signing up. They think someone else will do it. But one idea that did work was we created a telefriend form. We said anyone who has a website wants their users to tell their friends about their website. So we said we're going to give webmasters a telefriend form. We'll give it to them for free. And if anyone, um, while they're sending a telefriend, while they're telling their friends about the webmaster site, if they also want to sign up to one of our mailing lists, there's a checkbox they could check off a check. They could put a check in and get our mailing list. We were doing that. It did okay, but it wasn't really blowing our minds. So we said, how do we blow our minds? We want to be huge. 
So he said, what if we pay people? So we'll say to any webmaster, we'll give you 10 cents every time somebody uses a telefriend form to tell their friends about your website. So we're giving you a tool that helps people find out about your website and we're paying you every time they – so we're not just helping you get more users, not just making it easier for your, for your users to tell their friends about your site. We're paying you for that. And so people signed up and they put our telefriend form on their site and they came up with all these crazy ways of, of generating more telefriends. They would start begging. They would say, after you tell a friend, you'll get this special thing. They would do all kinds of stuff to get 10 cents per, per person. There's one couple. Um, I still remember their, their names, but I don't know that I should say it out loud. But um, they decided to create greeting cards with this. They created these little fun pages, fun greeting cards, and they put our telefriend uh, button on the bottom. And every time somebody wanted to send a greeting card to their friends, they were using our telefriend form. And these guys were just racking up orders, racking up telefriends, racking up dimes from us. And once they did it, other people picked up on it, and they did that too. And so we were now growing like wildfire. Our mailing list was big. Our telefriend form was big. It was huge. And that eventually became our, our big hit. Right. So it transitioned from uh, an email content delivery service to focus more on the, the greeting cards. Yeah. So now here's the problem that you have. You think about this business, you say, that sounds great, but you're giving away dimes to people. And our idea was, well, when, when their audience signs up for our mailing list, we're going to make money a fraction of a penny every day per person. And in time, we'll make our dime, and then we'll make another dime, and another, and another. Problem was that these guys were, were getting so many telefriend forms that we couldn't keep up with it. We'd have to give them hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, and we didn't have that with the idea that one day we'll make those, that money back. So we said, how do we make our money today, right now? As soon as we give a dime out, I want to make, I want to make my money back. I want to make my dime back. And we discovered something called, uh, I guess it was called lead, the leads business today is what you'd say, lead generation. And so every time you told a friend about, um, uh, about every time a user told a friend about a webmaster site, we also would say to him, hey, do you also want to sign up for this other product, this other service? And the, the leads companies that would, the leads companies paid us to generate those leads. So we were making maybe a buck, a buck fifty per lead, and we were paying out a dime every time somebody filled out a telefriend form. So if you, Yarrow, had a greeting card business and used our telefriend form, every time one of your users told a friend, uh, every time one of your users sent out one of your greeting cards, we'd give you 10 cents. After they finished sending the greeting card, we'd say, oh, wait a minute, do you also want to sign up for BMG Music Service and agree to buy a CD uh, from BMG in exchange for getting one free? Or do you also want to get a free magazine? And if, you, if the user accepted a magazine or CD, my company would get paid. Right. And that's what built up to, to millions of dollars a year in revenues. So it was co-registration is what we, we'd call that in internet marketing. Yeah, so interesting. Uh, I don't know when co-registration began. Um, it's, it's certainly been around a while. But you guys would have been, I'm assuming, part of the pioneering group in that area. Because uh, did you see it all over the place? or? No, it was very hard to convince companies to do it. We were doing full-on lead gen even beyond. So the co-registration, I think... And you'd know better than I would about what the names are. I think co-registration is just a checkbox within a form. Usually, and so when yeah. you're registering for one, you're, co you're also registering for another. We also did lead gen, which means that there's a whole other form that the user had to fill out. And we were collecting leads. Those are long forms. Even to this day, companies are not comfortable having their forms hosted on someone else's site, which is what we needed. So we had to convince them that it would be okay. We had to take the user's data and then automatically populate the forms on their site because they didn't know how to code it up. Yeah. We found different clever ways to do it. And when you say we, is it just you and your brother still? It was me and my brother at first and then we built it up from there to we hired our friends and then we went on and hired their friends and then we went on, <laughs> we went to uh, Headhunters and we got ripped off as we were hiring their friends. Really? Uh, so at its peak, how many people did you have as employees? Uh, at our height, 50 plus people. Okay. So it, it really ballooned. And how many subscribers onto your, your list uh, at its peak? I think at the end when we sold, it was 20 unique, 20 million unique subscribers, 30 million subscriptions, I think. 
That's a big list. That's some power. So uh, you were you just described the model you'd use to generate the revenue. Were you also using that list though for um, you know marketing purposes as well? Was, was it or was it just during the registration process that you profited? We were. It wasn't making as much money, but we were also getting money from the email list. So we would still run that. We ran the. Um, the emails the way I described it at first, which is you'd have a little bit of content, a little bit of an ad, and that's what you'd get every day. Then when the market tanked, we said, well, we need to maintain our revenues. So why don't we once a week send out a promotional email saying, hey, you know how you've been signing up and getting our joke a day every day? Well, here's a word from our sponsor. <laughs> and that kind of hurt the relationship that we had with our, with our end users, as you can imagine. Yeah. Commercialization, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch out not to not to kill the goose. That's all about the relationship, isn't it? So yeah, and more so nowadays. So let's see, what year are we at when you were at your peak? Um, I don't know. I've got the the chronology. I've got the Ernst and Young report. We did Ernst and Young one year, and then we did Holtz and Rubenstein the next year as our auditing company. So the revenue that I that I was telling you was the year 2000. The year 2000 we did, I'll look through it right here. Um, that's, that's, that's why revenue, like oh that's a balance sheet, income statement, revenue was 38.57 million in revenue wow. in the year 2000. And you technically started in 98 at this, this particular business, right? Or yeah. Now here's the breakdown. Listen to this. You and I are calling it co-registration or lead gen. At the time, it, those names weren't. We didn't know those names. Right. So our auditors called what we and what you and I are calling co-reg and lead gen. They called it member member services because we were mm. getting new members to those systems. Right. So member services brought in 25 million. Advertising, which is the ads in the mailing list, brought in 13.4 million. So that's the way that that broke down, and that's how we got to thirty-eight million. But it's interesting; I didn't notice it until now that the names are different. Yeah, uh, and you know, it's almost uh, nowadays. If you, if you were going to structure your business, you'd want to call it members because it just seems like a, a more friendly relationship with your subscribers for them to be members rather than leads. I mean, you know, who wants right. to call a lead? So, okay, so we we've I'm I'm really impressed by the the rapid growth you had there, and I guess. Before we move on and end, I guess, the point where you sold this business, can you tell me really what would be the, the leverage points you believe here? Because that's un, what's ridiculously rapid growth. Most companies don't get that. Most people, you know, I've never had a company that's gone that quickly, that large. So what were the, the key leverage points for people who have these big picture ideas and want to get that kind of growth and reach the seven, eight figure mark in a matter of months and years? What, what would you recommend for them looking for leverage points to really get in rapid scale? Um, here, here are a few things that I learned and then if I don't give you the leverage point hold me to it and make sure that I clarify it but here's, here's the first thing we had no money when we started out we couldn't get funding because we didn't have any connections we didn't know where to get started to get funding we had to do it ourselves I got money to build the business and I've talked about this on, on Mixergy on my site I needed money to fund the business I looked at my old J. Crew clothes J. Crew sold these clothes that were uh, they, they sold them by mail order and they said you could return them at any time. I looked at my old clothes. I called up the company and I said, I've worn these clothes. Can I still get a refund? The woman said, yes. I said, I wore them in the subway in New York City where it gets dirty. Can I still get a refund? The woman goes, that's our policy, sir. I said, all right, where do I send it? I sent in my clothes. They sent me a check for a few hundred bucks. I know it sounds skeezy and I'm going to turn off some of your users, so some of your uh, listeners, so it's a good thing we're saying it later on in the, in the video. But it's the truth and I want to be as truthful as possible. And that's how I funded the business. That's where we got the money that helped us get started. Right. All those uh, emails that were going out, I said that they could work on desktops. We couldn't even afford desktops when we started. What we did was we, I called up Staples and I said, what's your return policy on computers? He said, same thing as everything else. So he's saying, just like a stapler that I could buy today and return it in 90 days and get my money back, same thing with computers. The one said, that's our policy. I go, what if I buy a computer from you and use it every day for 89 days and on the 90th day I return it back to you? Can I get my money back on the 90th day? The woman says, that's our policy. I said, great, send me six. So she sent me six computers and every 90 days we would stop our business, we would package those six computers up, we would send them back to Staples and we get a new set of computers. 
They eventually reduced it to, from 90 days to 30 to 15 days, and I don't know what their refund policy is. But I do know the big point here. The big point is there's always a freaking way if you've got a mission. Our mission was we were going to be entrepreneurs. We were going to build this business. We believed as much as you can possibly believe that email was the answer. We imagined to ourselves that email was going to be as big a business as regular web business. And when you believe, when you've got that kind of a mission, there's always a way and you find it. And that's how we found those ways. Um, now, it turns out that email, as I've told you, did not end up being what we thought it would be. We thought we thought you would be able to do your banking through email. We thought you'd be able to get HTML emails, which happened, but then you would do all the actions of a web page inside your email box. So you'd get an email from Citibank saying, or let's not take Citibank, let's say, um, what else do we do online? I can't think of any better examples. So let's say you get an email from Citibank saying, you now have uh, uh, this charge on your credit card. Are you willing to accept it? Within your inbox, I thought you could click yes, and then you could keep transacting and all that. So um, I don't want to get too far away from my point. The point that I'm trying to make is it didn't end up being that way. And so we adjusted and we adjusted and we adjusted. And that's the second thing that I learned. I went into business thinking that you have to set one very clear goal and you have to go at that goal without any, without, without looking left or right. Turns out you have to keep adjusting and adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. And so that's the second thing. Third thing is I told all my friends I graduated from a good school. I graduated with high honors which because I was a big freaking nerd. And I could have gotten a great job. And all my friends did. And they would say, Andrew, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go start this business. And they go, really? You're going to start a business? And I go, yeah, I'm going to do it. Go, do you know how much you're giving up? And I go, yes, I do. And I know that if I don't start a business, I'd be giving up something that I'm really passionate about. So I've got to be an entrepreneur. They would then look at this web page that I created that I described to you where people can sign up to our mailings and they would go, that, Andrew, that is what you're starting a business for? This ugly looking template thing? And I go, yeah. And I go, that, that's what you're going to build your empire on, this so-called thing? And they were laughing at me. And I said, yeah, of course. You start off with something ugly and then you improve it and you improve it and you improve it until eventually it becomes what for us was a a 20 plus million person email database with a 30 plus million dollar a year revenue base but that doesn't start overnight you can't start day one with the perfect ideal business I've interviewed people on Mixergy.com entrepreneurs who got the millions that I couldn't get from investors who put it all into this business who are gonna make the perfect launch the perfect product on day one because they wanted to impress their friends or TechCrunch or who knows who and then they failed because they put too much time into version one, and once they came out with it, the public wasn't crazy about it. Point I'm making is you got to start with garbage. You then you then throw version one away, and you start you build version two. But if it's so cheap that you accept, and so simple that you accept, you're going to toss it out. You can get it out the door quickly. Start with garbage. Finally, you asked me about leverage. How are we able to grow so fast? And it's true. We actually had that hockey stick where. I thought I was going to have slow and steady growth for years and it ended up being slow and steady growth for a while and then boom, we hit millions in revenue, millions in, in members and what happened was we created a machine where we were getting paid to grow and by that I mean we were paying a dime every time somebody filled out our telefriend form and eventually paying a quarter but we started out with a dime and getting paid a buck fifty. So when you're paying people, you're really motivating them like mad and when you're getting paid more than you're paying them then you've got a business that's a machine. And what I've noticed is the people who I've interviewed on Mixergy, the entrepreneurs who built things quickly, rapidly, were doing it by paying others, very often through affiliate programs, to build something for them and then um, and getting paid themselves in, in the process. And you've done work with, uh, with who are the people who, who uh, designed your website? Um, yeah, unique blog designs. Uh, unique blog designs. Unique blog designs. I talked to Josh, who's uh, one of the founders of the company. He created a theme that brought in tons of money. I forget exactly how much money he brought in with that theme. But he did it because he was paying affiliates to go out there and promote a firm and every time. Yeah, no, I was um, one of the top affiliates time. for that. So affiliate theme. Yep. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, I, if I was to summarize that, I'd say that the key points there are some sort of incentivization and the possibility to scale unlimitedly as, as many people as are online as possible. So you're not limited by yourself or the technology and there's you know money to be made for the person doing the promotion so yeah very good very um, good I'm just hearing my I'm getting my voice back Andrew you might want to turn me down a little bit oh sorry about that okay 
Not that I don't love my own voice, but you know. Uh, <laughs> so moving on then, this business obviously is not something you're involved with anymore today. Uh, how did it all end up, wrap up? We got to a place where, where I got burned out, where I also got – we were making millions. I mean like tens of millions and then suddenly we went down to making millions. And I said, oh, I'm such a freaking failure. What is wrong with me that I got, you know? You start to you, – you start to – uh, your expectations change, and I started to just feel like, well, I work this hard, and things aren't going as well as they used to, which means I'm going backwards in life. And then the market got bad, and then our advertisers went bankrupt, and they owed us millions of dollars, and and people weren't sending out as many telefriends anymore, and and all that, and and we were sending out more emails to our people than we should have, and they were they were upset, and all that, and. And then some, and then I started to just get really burned out. I was working day in and day out for years, going back to when we started the company, when we were worried that our little crazy setup of, of uh, Staples computers would stay up. And if they weren't, I would wake myself up. In fact, I used to sleep with an alarm attached to my leg, a vibrating alarm attached to my leg where every couple of hours it would wake me up so I can go make sure the, the computers are up. And you eventually you get burned out. And I said, if I ever fail, if I fail completely, I'm going to be a big loser I'm going to be like – I thought because – I built the business because I thought I was this big nerd who had something to prove to myself and the world. And here I was now potentially failing after all those years of work, potentially feeling like – feeling like all that hard work didn't undo the worries that I had about where I was going with my life. I said I wasn't dating. I didn't have any experiences that weren't business. I don't own a house. I don't have any interest outside of work. What am I if this business fails? What am I about here? What am I missing out on? Let me stop you for a second, Andrew. How could you not own a house when you're turning over eight figures a year with your business? Like, oh, um, actually, it was worse than that. I refused to pay off my personal credit cards and take any money out of the business because I, I thought it would be a demotivator. I, I never owned my own house. I never took money. I, I kept the credit cards. I kept my high credit card debt. Because I thought that going in every every month and moving money from one credit card to another and paying them all off, I thought that that put me in touch with what f fired me up in the early days. That the idea that I have to pay attention to every dollar would keep me focused. And my brother would say, Andrew, just don't waste your time on that. Take money out of the business and go and do it. And I said, no. I said, if I had my own money, it would keep me from being hungry. I thought if I had fun in my life, it would keep me from being hungry. I see you. You travel. So you, you understand the value of having some other interest in your life. I didn't. I thought that that was just a waste of time. Um, and so I didn't even take any money out, out of the business. I thought I'm just going to keep it in there. I'm going to keep doubling down, doubling down, building up my business. Um, and then, I, and then I said, well, what's my life about? And I said, well, if I can sell this, if we get into a place where I can sell it, I'm not going to look for the best deal I can get. I'm just looking – I'm going to look for not the best financial deal but the best deal that would give me the freedom to go and do other things. And I actually remember that we almost sold to a company and I, and I would think about all day long. I would fantasize about what I would do and how great vacation would be and where I was going to go. And I started reading ja Jack Kerouac's On the Road. <laughs> And then the company said, nope, Andrew, sorry, no deal. And I got, oh, so depressed. And then I got another deal. And then the company also backed away or gave me a bad deal. I got, again, I, stopped, I put down Jack Kerouac a second time. I never will pick up Jack Kerouac's book on the road. It's my bad luck book. <laughs> Finally, we ended up selling to a competitor of ours, somebody who was also in the, in the telefriend greeting card business, somebody who also had a mailing list, we, someone who we fought with but I also stayed in touch with. And we, I said, I'm going to sell you the business, but I, I got to leave. And he said, well, Andrew, I'll give you a great consulting contract for a couple of years. You'll make good money and you'll be able to, to be there as a resource. So no, I got to leave. We sold him. He accepted it because he could run it on his own and I just took off. I gave away all my stuff. I put my books in my parents' house. I had these two chairs that I'm sentimental about that I kept. Everything else I just gave away. I gave away my bed. I gave away my couch. I gave everything away and I just traveled. I take it you were financially independent. After that sale, right? Yes, I said as long as I I don't become stupid and go gamble or de or develop a cocaine habit or I don't know what other mistakes people make, I'm gonna be okay. Okay, so I, I didn't think you might want to torture yourself some more by I don't know putting all that money into a 
bank account that you can't touch until you start your next business that's making X amount of dollars because you want to feel hungry still or something like that. <laughs> so, no. I kind of, I kind of did, but I did leave myself enough money to go and, and explore life. I just wanted to have no obligations. I didn't even buy, I didn't put it in stocks. I didn't put it in real estate the way people said. I, I just put it in the most safe, the safest things I could, the most out of touch things I could. And let me just live off of the little bit that I okay. plan to take out. And I take it your brother was ready to sell at that time as well? Yeah. Okay, so you're both good to go. All right. So uh, it's a very quick journey. Like two, when did you sell? Was that 2001? 2003. 2003. Okay, so you had it for a few more years after that, right? Uh, is it still going now? Um, not a, actually, I don't know. I lost touch with what's going on with it. For a long time, mailbits.com was up and running as a greeting card site, and some of our other properties. We had grab.com also as one of our sites. They were up and running, and then some of them recently, for some reason, stopped. I don't know why. Um, so, I, but I don't even know what happened with the mailing list. I just moved on. Okay. So you traveled a bit, and uh, now you've come back, I believe, and, and you're looking at, obviously, you run Mixergy. Can, can you tell us maybe you know, how, how you got to where you are today from that point before? Sure. I, I said to myself when I was building my business, all the experts, the so-called experts, don't know jack about business. Um, I said if I ever could, I would find a way to have real business people teach business. Um, and you know how it is. You're a guy who, who's teaching people business. Imagine if you weren't at the same time in business. Imagine if at the same time you didn't have the same issues of how do you get customers, how do you get people, how do you create good product for them, how do you – if how could you teach somebody how to get how to grow their mailing list if you Yaro don't have a mailing list so you know the difference you know that when you're actually doing it you've got a different perspective I said I want to create a place where where real business people teach real business and that's what Mixergy is a mix of real business people teaching startups how they did it okay so that's let's let's spell that out for people because it's a tough one <laughs> I know I probably should have come up with a better name I'm not very good at coming up with names <laughs> but it's Mixergy M I X E R G Y. I should come up with a little jingle for it. M I X E R G Y. Dot com. <laughs> well, dot listen, com. I've got entrepreneurs hyphen journey dot com, and no one can spell entrepreneur. So it's, it's <laughs> yeah, not only that. You know what? My where is that? My management book from high school, which I still probably have here, misspelled entrepreneur. I said that's the way that entrepreneurship is is respected in schools. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how to spell it. I'm t I take it this Mixergy project's not so much about profitability, more about uh, you know I guess free information, education, and just helping other people with with business business truth. Yes, in fact, for years I've just been the only one spending money on it. Um, Sony, uh, not Sony, um, uh, Sun. When I was doing events, sponsored the events, and a couple of other companies did and helped me pay for the events. But um, but. For the most part, it's just been my couch outlay forever. I do interviews with people like uh, you mentioned Gideon, um, the founder of Wikipedia came on to talk about how he got all those people to work on Wikipedia for free. Um, a lot of different entrepreneurs keep, come on and teach. Uh, I think at some point I'm going to have to start bringing in some kind of revenue. And that the reason I say that is because I'm now starting to hire editors to, to edit my videos. You're now in, in video and – You'll see it's a bear. You and I have a good connection. A lot of people in the internet space don't even have a good internet connection. So I do an interview with them and the connection breaks off a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So now I have to sit and edit it uh -huh. together. It's a fun so now job. I've hired somebody <laughs> to edit for me. Okay, so now we'll wrap up the interview, but I, I find it hard to believe that Mixergy is going to be enough for a person like you. I feel like you're maybe still recharging your batteries from, from the earlier days. Do you feel that you're heading in, in another big project direction or? You're not really thinking about it. Who knows? It. I, I think maybe Mixergy could be that big project. Okay. Maybe something else will. But I'm completely committed to Mixergy being a place where people can teach. And maybe I need to do that better. Frankly, I should probably learn from you. You've got one of the best educators. Now I'm going to sound like a commercial for you. But I've been watching you for a long time. You are so good. And you and Gideon, I told you guys both. I told them that, that you guys are both like this. You're so good at explaining even the basics. You will, you will. I sign up for your mailing list, and right after I sign up, you give me a quick explanation of how I could confirm my mailing list. Now, anyone by now should know how to confirm their mailing list, but who knows? Maybe somebody doesn't. You teach them how to do it quickly, and for me, a person who's been confirming mailing lists since the beginning of the internet, it feels like I don't feel talked down to by the way you explain it. I just feel like Yara's giving me a quick explanation. I feel like there's so much I can learn. 
So who knows? Maybe I'll learn something from you, and I'll be able to build my my next empire from it's that. It's all Maybe about having a strange accents remember. just to keep people's attention. I think that's the key. So. <laughs> The All accents right. to keep their attention? I can't do that. Yeah, well, no. Hello, your governor. Accent's strange for some confirm people. confirm my mailing list. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> um, all right, Andrew. That's great stuff. Thank you for the, the kind words, too. Um, MixerG.com, for anyone listening, is, I'm guessing, the, the best place to get a hold of what you're up to nowadays. And, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's a fantastic story you just told. And I think very inspiring for a lot of people who are looking for that exponential growth because, you know, not everyone's happy with a uh, hundred grand a year style of business. You know, some people want a hundred grand a year and then spend the rest of the time traveling. Others want to shoot for the stars and, and get to eight or even nine figure type sales. So it's nice to get a perspective of someone who's been there. So thank you for that. You bet. You bet. It feels one of the best things that you could do, I think, is be an entrepreneur. Mark Cuban recently said the best thing you could do for your country is the most patriotic thing you could do for your country is go out and get rich. Entrepreneurs who build companies who get rich in the process are helping the country, helping the world by bringing out new ideas, by bringing in new revenue streams, by hiring people, by keeping them employed. What you and I are doing, what you are doing, I think, right now, um, even more than I am, is helping entrepreneurs grow, and I think it's it's great work. Now, everyone who's watching this needs to go out there and build an incredible company, or frankly, if you can't from this, come back and tell me, come back and tell Yaro what we, what we need to do differently. I know Yaro. I've watched his YouTube videos. He's got little scraps of paper with your feedback to Yaro about how you want him to help you teach him. So he's studying every little bit of information that you could tell him. So if this video, if this interview didn't help you, Come back and tell me your Yaro, and you know, go tell Yaro. He'll he'll keep notes on you forever. <laughs> but the, but bottom line is, a lot of passion here to help get you there. And if it's not getting you there, then be open and let us know, and we'll find another way to do it. Right? Fantastic, Andrew. I can see your passion already. So uh, let's hopefully that infects some other people here. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. You bet. Thank you, Yaro. <laughs>